Hello, good afternoon or good morning, and uh, welcome to the next uh, installment of our PFF Disease Education Webinar Series. Um, I am Amy Hajari Case. I'm Senior Medical Advisor for Education and Awareness, and I am so glad that you are joining us for this, um, this wonderful talk that we're going to have. We will be talking about comprehensive care of pulmonary fibrosis um, managing not just the pulmonary fibrosis, but other associated and some unassociated medical conditions. We use the term comorbidities. Um, we have a, a guest speaker with us today, Dr. Ross Summer. We're so glad you're here, thank you. Um, I will introduce him in just a moment, but before getting started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you will look at the control panel, it's probably on the right of your screen. You can look at the handouts tab, there's a little triangle there. And if you would like to download our slides today, you can do that at the, um, at the handouts tab. You can submit questions for us. We will try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of our um, discussion today. But if you want to submit a question, uh, you can do that as well on your control panel at the questions tab. Or if you're having any technical difficulties, something along those lines, um, you can use the chat function that's there at the bottom. Um, at the end of our talk, um, please stay just for a moment or two. Um, you will not have another opportunity, but if you will just stay with us when the uh, webinar closes, there is an opportunity there to provide feedback on our um, discussion today, as well as the series, and um, help us shape these um, lectures going forward into the future. So. Um, Without any further ado, Dr. Ross Summer is a board certified pulmonary and critical care physician and an NIH funded investigator at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, where he started the ILD program there in 2012. He trained at LSU in New Orleans and at Johns Hopkins University, and he is now professor of medicine and the section chief of pulmonary critical care at um, Thomas Jefferson and he maintains an active laboratory and oversees clinical trials related to pulmonary fibrosis. Um, I'm so glad you're here, and so um, I will just uh, let you do your thing and get started. I will pass over, not the mic, but the mouse. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Case, and, and uh, I wanna welcome everybody uh, to this PFF disease educational webinar uh, series. And this specific one, uh, as was mentioned, uh, entitled Comprehensive Pulmonary Fibrosis Care, Managing All of Your Medical Conditions. And I really want to thank the PFF, not only for inviting me, but also for picking this topic, which I think is really important and something that's uh, ignored uh, in the medical literature. So I won't go into details about me, but hopefully I look similar. This is before the pandemic, and I feel like pandemic has made me age significantly. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose uh, uh, relating to this talk. And then one other uh, medical disclaimer that should be mentioned is that uh, any information contained in this presentation is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for, for professional medical advice. And please always consult your personal physician or healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your specific uh, medical condition. Okay, so let's uh, uh, get into the talk. And I thought before we get into the specific topic of today that I would provide a little bit of background on pulmonary fibrosis, uh, the lung, and how the lung uh, functions just to get everybody up to speed. So pulmonary fibrosis refers to conditions that cause scarring of the lung. And to understand that in, in, in the kind of uh, uh, on a pathologic level, I think it's helpful to have a, a basic understanding of how the lung uh, structure is. And so here on the left is an illustration, a cartoon depiction of the lung. And as in most cartoon depictions, the lung is represented as two kind of large balloons, a balloon on the right side of the patient, and the left side of the patient, and then there's a tube that branches, almost looks like a tree upside down that delivers air to different parts of the lung. While this representation is correct, 
uh, I think it uh, under uh, um, demonstrates the complexity of the actual lung. And instead of the lung being comprised of two large balloons on the right, in reality, it's comprised of millions and millions of little teeny balloons, okay? In fact, in the adult lung, there's roughly 400 million little balloons that are called alveoli. And this little box right here is enlarged just to show you one region of the lung. And what you can see in this little box are a bunch of tiny little balloons. And these are called alveoli or air sacs. And this is where all the action happens in the lung. This is where the oxygen comes in from the environment and goes into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide from the blood vessels goes back into the air spaces and then expelled from the body. Now, one thing in addition to a whole bunch of air sacs I want you to appreciate from this picture is the beautiful and intricate network of capillaries or blood vessels that surround each air sac, which are arteries and veins, okay? And this is very important for the gas exchange purpose. Now, I wanna take you over to the right, which is just one of these air sacs and one of these blood vessels. The air sac is representing the light green and the dark green is the blood vessel. And what I want you to appreciate is the close proximity of the air sac to the blood vessel. And they're right next to each other because that's really important for gas exchange. What I also want you to appreciate is this area between the airway and the blood vessel is largely devoid or, and there's very little material in between. And this allows the free flow of gases. However, in pulmonary fibrosis, which is right here, a pulmonary fibrotic lung, what you can see is the space between the air sac and the blood vessel is largely obliterated and it's full of this material that we refer to as extracellular matrix or more commonly, scar tissue. Now, why the lung develops scar tissue and pulmonary fibrosis is still right, uh, uh, something that we intensely investigate in laboratories around the world. Although it's not clear why, I think the general mechanism is believed to be the same mechanism that happens with scar tissue in your skin. When you cut your skin, you have really one of two choices. You either completely heal it and you're left with no evidence of a previous cut, or you have some degree of scar tissue, whether that be small, moderate, or severe. Well, the same concept kind of holds true in the lung and that the lining cells, the cells that line the epithelium of the lung, are damaged, whether that be from cigarette smoke or other exposure or genetic predisposition, and that uh, it doesn't properly heal itself and it's left with scar tissue. You can imagine that this buildup of scar tissue would affect the transfer of gases like oxygen to the blood vessel and carbon dioxide out of the blood vessel. And that's really the basis of pulmonary fibrosis, um, no matter which condition. Uh, now, as I kind of mentioned in the last slide, that pulmonary fibrosis is not a single condition. And this is often uh, confusing in the literature, and I want to emphasize this, that the term pulmonary fibrosis represents any of those conditions that cause scarring. And in fact, there's probably 200 different types of pulmonary fibrosis out there. And on the right, I'm just showing you some common causes of pulmonary fibrosis. And some of you in the audience may either have these conditions or have a loved one with these conditions. And I've just listed them here. RA stands for rheumatoid arthritis, IPF, the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but there's hypersensitivity to pneumonitis, sarcoid, many other conditions. And I also want to point out that uh, each of these circles does not represent either the prevalence or incidence of these conditions. It just has things to do with my poor PowerPoint presentation skills and drawing circles. Uh, and I'm just trying to tell you that there's a lot of causes of pulmonary fibrosis. So, when you're given the diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis, it requires a deep commitment to your health. And you could probably say this for any serious medical condition or chronic medical condition, whether that be heart disease or cancer. Once you're given a diagnosis that can be kind of serious, you really have to commit to it. And what do I mean by that? That means frequent monitoring of your symptoms, frequent follow-up to your doctor. It could be frequent testing, such as in the case pulmonary function tests, laboratory tests. And then there's uh, 
times when you may need to establish relationships with more than one doctor because your condition involves more than organ. Now, what I've always historically seen in patients that are given a diagnosis of permanent fibrosis or any other uh, chronic condition is that they have a hierarchical focus on their health, meaning that if lung disease is their most serious illness, they put it on the top of the list. And that means there's a chance that it's at the expense of other conditions. So they start to ignore their heart or their mood or their joints or the skin. And then what happens is by focusing only on the lung, these other conditions may move up the ladder and move up the hierarchy. And in, sometimes they jump ahead of the primary condition. This hierarchical focus on people's health, I think is a major problem. And the literature is now suggesting that it's too. So here's a, 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 a cartoon depiction of somebody with lung disease. And the point is that major illnesses often lead people to ignore their other conditions. And in this case, this gentleman is only focused on his breathing and probably has asthma or COPD or some lung condition. And he has a skin lesion or a rash or something that he uh, is um, aware of, but it doesn't bother him. And he leads, uh, and he ignores it for a while, and this ends up leading to well, skin cancer possibly, and then a larger problem than it would have been if he was focusing on his health. And this has been demonstrated, although in the lung field, people don't talk about it very much, this major focus on the lung and at the expense of other uh, uh, organs, it has been demonstrated in patients with heart disease. For example, patients with heart disease are often diagnosed uh, with uh, cancer at later stages than those with heart disease. And patients with heart disease are more likely to die of cancer than patients or without heart disease. And what these studies suggest is the major reason for this is that um, you know, patients are ignoring these other symptoms and presenting later stages of disease when it's less easy to treat. Okay, so comprehensive pulmonary fibrosis care in my mind involves more than just caring for your lungs. And I created these two scenarios just to demonstrate to the audience of how I see sometimes things unfolding in my clinic because people are ignoring certain symptoms. And I wish they would have told me about them earlier. So the first patient on the right, uh, uh, or if you're spacing me, but on my left, uh, presents six months ago with joint pain. His joint pain is bothering him. It's his knee pain. He doesn't think he needs to tell me about it. So he stops exercise and quits his pulmonary rehab program. Because he had a lot of friends in his pulmonary rehab program, he misses them and he gets sad and doesn't actually even want to really hang out with family. And he misses those friends that he made. And then to kind of alleviate some of his sadness, he starts to eat food that he normally doesn't, uh, he knows is good for him, uh, maybe more greasy food or fatty foods. And then he starts to develop heartburn. And then because of the heartburn, he stops taking his uh, uh, antifibrotic drugs. And then the second patient um, who really started about a year ago not sleeping well, she noticed that, um, uh, that uh, she had uh, difficulty falling asleep and she was waking up a lot. Because of her lack of sleep, she started developing headaches. To treat her headaches, she started drinking more wine. And this led to gout, this led her to stop exercising, also participating in the pulmonary rehab program. And this is how she uh, presents to me. I know these are just theoretical scenarios, but I can tell you countless ones which started with a minor issue and became a much more major issue. And this is why I think comprehensive pulmonary fibrosis care involves more than just focusing on your lungs. Now, a term I want to introduce everybody to is something called comorbidity. Okay, basically, this is a fancy term used to describe two or more diseases or medical conditions in the same patient. So examples of this is that, uh, you know, if you use this in a sentence, my patient has three comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, and pulmonary fibrosis. Or you could say, I have pulmonary fibrosis and my other comorbidities are joint disease and sleep apnea. 
Now, the only reason why I mention this term is that you could just call it other conditions, but if you're somebody who likes to follow the medical literature, it's helpful to know the terminology that's used and us doctors, researchers, talk about other conditions as comorbidities. So do I know that patients with pulmonary fibrosis have comorbidities? Well, yes, over the last decade or so, we have a lot of evidence to suggest patients with pulmonary fibrosis have a lot of comorbidities for other problems. And this is just one example of a study. This is called the Empire Registry Study. And this was a beautiful study out of Central and Eastern Europe which was from 11 countries. And what they did is they followed patients with one type of pulmonary fibrosis called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And it was a lot of patients, 3,580 patients. And they followed them every six months for up to six years. And they just looked at various aspects so we can learn about the disease. But one thing that they learned, looked at was comorbidities. And it turned out that 91% of patients, of these IPF patients, had at least one other condition one from more good things, so pulmonary fibrosis plus something else. But what was even more striking in the study is that 40% of patients had four comorbidities or more. So 40% of people had more, uh, four or more comorbidities. So uh, you may be asking yourself, why do patients with pulmonary fibrosis have so many comorbidities? And it's a really good question that we don't really understand why, okay? But I would say that one reason why patients with pulmonary fibrosis uh, have other conditions is that risk factors for pulmonary fibrosis are also risk factors for other conditions. What do I mean by that? So older age, pulmonary fibrosis is not really a condition of young people, although there are subtypes like sarcoidosis that can occur in younger people. Most people with pulmonary fibrosis are, are 50 years or older. And with uh, uh, um, older age comes other things such as joint disease or bone loss, heart disease, and even cancer. There are also certain forms of pulmonary fibrosis that are more common in certain senses. So for example, IPF is more common in males. Well, men are also more likely to get heart disease and prostate problems. Smoking, which is a risk factor for some uh, forms of pulmonary fibrosis, in particular IPF. Well, that's also a risk factor for COPD and cancer and even heart disease. One's past exposures that may be associated with pulmonary fibrosis could be, could be also a risk factor for other lung diseases, such as asthma and COPD. And lastly, the genetics that led you to have pulmonary fibrosis can be associated with other conditions. And one good example of this is in IPF, there's a bunch of mutations that have been identified in familial forms of that, such as those related to telomere mutations. And those mutations have also been linked to other conditions, such as liver disease and bone marrow failure. So the genetics that predispose you to that may also predispose you to other conditions. The other reason why people with pulmonary fibrosis develop other problems is that the condition itself or the treatments the doctor, the doctor puts you on can cause other problems. So for example, being breathless because of your pulmonary fibrosis may reduce your physical activity, which then could contribute to joint pain or muscle strains when you do decide to exercise. Reduced physical activity can also lead to weight gain and a variety of other problems. Pulmonary fibrosis can also affect blood flow to the lung. And so how does it do that? Well, basically the scar tissue that builds up and the picture I showed you early on can disrupt the blood flow, uh, making it harder for the heart to pump into the lung, the blood, which can lead to high blood pressure and pulmonary blood vessels, which can lead to something also known as uh, pulmonary hypertension. Now, many patients with pulmonary fibrosis cough a lot, and coughing is a very violent action, right? It causes the stomach to contract. And, and by coughing a lot, that can irritate the stomach. It can also cause the reflux of stomach contents into the esophagus. And in some cases, it can reflux all the way up to the mouth, and potentially in the lung. And some people believe uh, this can uh, contribute to 
progression of pulmonary fibrosis, although this is a very hard situation. And lastly, the treatments that doctors prescribe can actually contribute to problems. So for example, some forms of pulmonary fibrosis are treated with steroids, which can cause diabetes or weaken the bones. And some other treatments, such as the antibiotic agents, can cause a bunch of other problems, such as heartburn, indigestion, and diarrhea. So what are the common comorbidities in patients with pulmonary fibrosis? To simplify things, I created this pie chart, and I'm just showing you the three major categories of comorbidities, that being heart disease, lung disease, and other conditions. As you can see from this pie chart, the vast majority, or 50% of all patients with pulmonary fibrosis, and this is mostly talking about because the literature is vast in the IPF population, so IPF patients, but I think from my review of patients in the clinic, this holds true for all forms of fibrosis. But heart disease seems to be uh, a major player with 50% of patients uh, uh, having some form of heart disease. Okay, so what are the heart comorbidities? Well, most people have high blood pressure as their heart condition, and that's seen 50% of pulmonary fibrosis patients, in particular those with IVF, but also hypercholesterolemia, coronary artery disease, or also this kind of myocardial infarction, heart attack. But there's other conditions such as valvular heart disease, stroke, and vascular disease. And one thing I want to talk about about uh, heart comorbidities is high blood pressure. Now, often patients, and I wouldn't say often, but many of my patients come in with elevated blood pressure when they see me. Most of my patients say that it's because I make them nervous or my white coat or something else and that their blood pressure is fine at home. I'm okay with that and I always <clears throat> ask them to please recheck their blood pressure at home. But if your blood pressure is elevated, it's a very important thing to focus on because many people refer to high blood pressure as a silent cure because you have no symptoms from it. And as you may know, uh, high blood pressure is associated with serious complications such as stroke and kidney disease. So blood pressure monitoring is very important in my patient population. In terms of lung comorbidities, various lung diseases seem to be you know, seem to track in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. The overwhelming uh, or the most common condition that uh, in patients with pulmonary fibrosis is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease which I'm gonna give a little extra attention to on my next slide. Also asthma, just like it's in the rest of the population, 5% of the population has asthma. This is the same in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And then pulmonary hypertension, which I briefly mentioned, um, I'll discuss. Uh, and let's not forget lung cancer, uh, that um, patients with pulmonary fibrosis uh, have a higher incidence, in particular idea of lung cancer. So COPD, I want to give a little extra attention to this because it's the most common of the lung diseases that occur in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And COPD, which uh, stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is a breathing disorder in which the airway tubes are tight, making it hard to breathe. And the best way to think about COPD, uh, in my mind, is think about breathing through a garden hose versus a straw. It's much easier to breathe through a garden hose than it is to breathe through a straw. Well, in COPD, the airway tubes get tight, uh, and, and that's when often associated with smoking, uh, where the muscles get uh, tight around the airways, and it makes it hard for you to breathe. This condition is very common, uh, as I mentioned, in patients with pulmonary fibrosis, and can cause significant breathlessness, meaning it can contribute to shortness of breath which is also a symptom of pulmonary fibrosis. And it can be very hard to dis distinguish whether the symptoms are related to your COPD or your pulmonary fibrosis. And this is why monitoring your symptoms are very important because the two conditions are treated very differently. So COPD is treated with medications that open the tubes or relax the airways such as albuterol or bronchodilator. The second pulmonary condition I want to mention is pulmonary hypertension. 
kind of briefly touched on this, this is a condition in which the blood pressure in the blood vessels of the lung, not the blood vessels that typically the doctor measures in the arm, but this is the blood that's going to the lung, that the pressure gets high. And this usually relates directly to the scar tissue that's accumulated in the lung. It's much more common in patients with pulmonary fibrosis than the regular population. But in particular, there are certain forms of pulmonary fibrosis, uh, such as scleroderma, uh, where uh, pulmonary hypertension is much more common. And pulmonary hypertension also is more common at the later stages of almost all forms of pulmonary fibrosis. And doctors need to start monitoring it uh, as lung function declines. This can be a very serious condition. It can cause worsening shortness of breath, even challenge the ability of the heart to function in some patients. The good news is over the last, um, even recently, the last couple of years, there's a new treatment that has come out for pulmonary hypertension in patients with uh, IPF, and there are treatments for patients with uh, uh, other forms of pulmonary hypertension, such as those with connective tissue disease and scleroderma. So it's important to recognize this, this condition early. Other notable conditions that, that seem to uh, track in patients with pulmonary fibrosis include many of the ones that are in the rest of the population, which includes diabetes, which is about 25% of patients with pulmonary fibrosis have gastrointestinal reflux, heartburn, allergies, joint disease, thyroid disease. And then three conditions I want to give special attention to are sleep apnea, anxiety, and depression. Okay, so for sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a breathing disorder in which breathing repeatedly starts and stops at night. There's two major types of sleep apnea. There is this obstructive component where actually the muscles in the airway kind of collapse when you go to sleep as they relax and obstruct the airway. And then there's a central type where it's actually the way that you control your breathing in your brain. And both of these conditions, whether it's central or obstructive, can lead to problems breathing at night. What happens when that, that occurs? Well, patients feel tired during the day, they don't feel refreshed in the morning, and this can lead not only to um, uh, a lower quality of life uh, because you're tired all the time, but also can have uh, downstream consequences, uh, such as uh, elevated blood pressure or even heart disease. And the reason why I wanted to give this special attention is because there is evidence that sleep apnea is exceedingly common in patients with pulmonary fibrosis. In fact, in one study of patients with IPF showed that 44 out of 50 patients, so 88% of patients with IPF had sleep apnea when they were tested. Other studies suggest the number is smaller but still sizable at 15%. So I'm always asking my patients about how they sleep, do they feel refreshed, and screening for sleep apnea. The other two conditions I wanted to focus on are anxiety and depression. And I think all of us know what anxiety and depression mean. All of us can be anxious at times. There's situational anxiety and situational depression, meaning like a certain events get you anxious, or a certain event gets you sad. But anxiety in the state of where it's pathologic is when it's excessive, uneasiness or apprehension, and you have panic attacks, and it's all the time. The same thing with depression. It's a state of persistently, persistently depressed mood and loss of interest, and really kind of fun activities. So this is my experience with anxiety and depression. The patient perception is that it's not important until it's important. So what I mean is that I ask patients, almost every patient about, do you have anxiety? Do you have depression? And they tell me it's really not important when it's mild or moderate, they admit to it, but they don't really want to discuss it. They don't want to uh, see anybody, they don't want to be on medications and um, they try to minimize it in my experience. And then it gets to be severe anxiety or real sadness, and then it becomes an important issue, okay? But I wanna change that, and I always tell my patients that think about anxiety and depression kind of as this meter. 
factors low, moderate, and high. And we can all agree, I think, that low level anxiety or moderate level anxiety over time is taxing, okay, and can produce a lot of stress and make you not want to participate in activities. And the accumulative effect of low level or moderate level anxiety or sadness can have a huge impact on the quality of your life. So I'm very focused on hearing what it, you know, people who complain of low level anxiety and how it's really impacting your life. So how can you determine if you have low level anxiety, high level anxiety, moderate level? Well, there's all kinds of scoring systems out there. And one of them I wanna focus on is the anxiety GAD7 score. And this is something you can find online. It's a very easy scoring system and I ask my patients. So basically, uh, you ask people over the last two weeks how often you felt the following. Do you feel nervous, anxious, or on edge? Not able to stop worrying. Worry too much about different things. Do you have trouble relaxing? Are you so restless that it's hard to sit still? Are you easily annoyed by your loved ones or people around you? You feel afraid that something often will happen to you soon. And then I ask people to tell me, is it not at all? Is it several days out of the two weeks? More than half of the days or nearly every, every day. And we come up with a score. And this has been validated in kind of large populations. And what you have the scoring system where you can decide whether you have minimal anxiety, uh, mild anxiety, moderate or severe. And I think these tools are very important for guiding next steps and doing prevention so that you can intervene in anxiety before it gets really severe. Okay, and this little link uh, provides you to one of these, uh, 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 the GAD7 scoring system. There are also scores for sadness or depression. And the PHQ9 scoring system is something I find very useful. So this also asks questions and there's a scoring system associated. And I'm just gonna read them to you. So do you have little interest or pleasure in doing things? Do you feel down, depressed, or even hopeless? Do you have trouble falling or staying asleep or sleeping too much? Do you feel tired, have little energy? Do you feel bad about yourself or that you're having, that you're a failure or that you've let yourself or your family down? In trouble concentrating on things such as reading the newspaper or watching television. And just like the GAD7 score, there's a, 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 a way to quantify uh, how sad you are based on your responses. And this tool has been used uh, by psychiatrists and also primary care physicians to kind of monitor uh, uh, sadness in the population. And I find this very useful in, in my primary diagnosis uh, population. So what can you do to manage all of your comorbidities? And how can you make sure that you don't do the hierarchical model that I talked about earlier, that you stay on top of all of your conditions? Well, I came up and I'm not married to this, but uh, this is the best I could do. It's an acronym that I call POMS, P-U-L-M-S, uh, short for pulmonary, uh, the poems. And so what the P stands for is primary care physician. The U is understand the signs and symptoms of all your comorbidities. L is learn your conditions and medication to treat them. M is monitor all of your symptoms closely. And last S is stay committed to better health. Now I'm going to go through each of these in a little more detail. So what do I mean by primary care physician? A primary care physician is your generalist, family practitioner, okay, that provides care to prevent, to prevent as well as treat illnesses and promote healthier living. A primary care physician is very important in the care of pulmonary fibrosis because they can keep track of things that your pulmonary pulmonologist may not remember or be familiar with. And research shows no matter what conditions you have, having a primary care doc favorably impacts your health and wellness outcomes. And this is just one study on the right, which demonstrated that 
uh, the number one risk factor for having severe uncontrolled hypertension, having complications from hypertension, is that you don't have a primary care physician. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1992, but there are countless studies out there demonstrating that having a primary care physician is likely to lead to better outcomes. The second is you understand signs and symptoms of all of your comorbidities. So all of us are different and all of us have different symptoms related to our conditions. And so for you, it's very important for you to understand your comorbidities and how they present um, in you. So for example, in some patients, cough and shortness of breath may be their pulmonary fibrosis. Whereas somebody else who doesn't usually cough from their pulmonary fibrosis, it's always their sinuses and it happens at certain times of year. Some people have weight gain. And they know it's not related to pulmonary fibrosis, but it's their heart. Some people who are urinating at night know that their diabetes is not under control. Joint disease may be immune disorder, leg edema, maybe heart, uh, and fatigue, maybe your sleep apnea, or maybe your thyroid is unhealed. So it's really important to understand your, your normal signs and symptoms of your problems so when they change, you can address this with your doctor. I think it's very important for everyone to learn their conditions, be able to say what conditions they have, and also understand which medications treat uh, which condition. Okay, so I know it's hard, the names of medications can be challenging, but I recommend everybody study their medications and understand exactly what they're used for. Okay, because sometimes you don't need medications. People stay on medications that they no longer need. And so if you understand why you're on it, uh, maybe you're more likely to talk to your physician about having it removed. I'll just put some examples up here. So ACE inhibitor controlled by blood pressure, my levothyroxine or my thyroid medication treats my thyroid, insulin treats my sugar, albuterol treats my asthma, and my beta blocker treats my heart. But I think it'd be nice just in simple terms to sit down with your doctor and find out what medications you're on and what they're for if you haven't done it before. Second, alas, is M, monitor your symptoms closely. And this is very, very important. You have to know your body. And so here are some things I put on the list. Has my cough changed in frequency or characteristic? So many people with pulmonary fibrosis have a cough, but all of a sudden it changed. It's now instead of dry, it could be wet or it could be more frequent. So that could be a sign of an acute exacerbation or an infection or something else. And it's very important to know this is not my characteristic cough. Therefore, I need to talk to my doctor. You should know how far you can walk, okay? So if you can walk a certain distance or a certain number of stairs, and all of a sudden it's changing, maybe, it, maybe it's something related to your condition or maybe it's something else, and you should let your doctor know. You're more fatigued than usual. Fatigue is not usually a feature of IPF. Maybe something else is going on. Maybe you have thyroid disease. Maybe you have sleep apnea. Maybe you're not sleeping well. You should let your doctor know. Am I suddenly losing weight or gaining weight? Okay, maybe you're accumulating fluid. Maybe you're developing pulmonary hypertension. All of these things matter to the doctor, okay, that we can pick up things early. My joints are bothering me more than usual. Perhaps the initial diagnosis was wrong. You were given a diagnosis of IPF, but really you have an autoimmune disorder. And now it's finally presenting itself. And lastly, you have new symptoms that you've never seen before. And they could be simple things like a dry mouth, and dry eyes. It could, to a pulmonologist, suggest that you have a different condition and it may not be uh, what the condition originally was thought to be. Okay, so monitor your symptoms closely. And lastly, okay, I think you need to stay committed to better health. And one tool that I often show patients is called the wellness wheel. And everybody has uh, a different emphasis on different parts of this wheel, so it may not be proportional in yours, but here's what the wellness wheel is. It's different aspects of total health. This could be spiritual, it could be religious or not religious, but you have some higher belief. Environmental, so uh, um, 
is your environment good? Do you feel safe? Do you feel supported? With people listening and understanding your condition and what you're going through. Your physical health, are you exercising? Are you taking care of yourself? Financial, which is the hardest to fix, um, uh, but, but are you preparing for the future? Social, you have a good social circle. Are, are, are your friends coming over? Are you inviting people? Are going out to dinner with you? Your emotional state, as I mentioned, are you having more anxiety, less anxiety, more, more sadness? Your occupation, if you're still working, or, or hobbies? And lastly, intellectual, which means are you reading? Are you challenging yourself? Are you doing things that keep you stimulated? Will that be a puzzle? Uh, or something uh, more difficult. And so everybody should have a wellness wheel and think about, and fill this in about exactly uh, how you're doing in each of these categories and, and discuss this with your physician. So that's it uh, uh, from, uh, and I'm, I'm open for questions about this, but the, the goal is for all of us to no longer do the hierarchical focus on just our lung and to take care of our total body to have total wellness um, and health and prevent fibrosis. So thank you so much. And I'd like to thank the sponsors, uh, BI, Genetech, and United Therapeutics uh, for their generous support. Thank you. Um, this is great. We have um, questions already coming in. So if that's okay with you, I'll just uh, we'll just talk about those. And uh, you know, part of getting to be the moderator here is I get to ask my own questions whenever I want to. <laughs> and so I'm going to start off with a question of my own. Um, how do you talk to um, patients about? I love this thought about knowing what are the symptoms of your different medical problems, um, and understanding you know why you're taking different medications and the different pieces of that. I think I see um, not only my patients, but also my colleagues, um, that a new, a new symptom that arises, a new concern that arises, is often attributed without a lot of thought to the pulmonary fibrosis. And when it comes to me, I go, oh, that may not make a lot of sense. Or perhaps we should look a little bit further at that because, yes, it could be. But there are these other common comorbidities or common, you know, coexisting problems that this this could be. We need to make sure we're not dealing with that. So, so talk a little bit about that for me. So, one thing I'd say for patients who are listening right now is that you really have to be an advocate for yourself. You can love your doctor, uh, uh, and your doctor can be as caring uh, and passionate as they can be. Uh, but but there's still a limited time you have with your doctor and care provider. So I would say that everybody has to be an advocate for themselves and really think about their symptoms. You also have to be a skeptic, okay? Because uh, because of the limited time, doctors hate to say it, but we can be wrong, okay? And so if a symptom persists and it's ongoing, I think you, you really need to kind of fight for your cause make sure people do their due diligence and search for alternative explanations. I would say cough and shortness of breath uh, are probably the only two things that I'm willing to accept uh, as causes of pulmonary fibrosis. Everything else has to be explained by something. And everything in 2022 should be able to be attenuated, meaning lessened to some degree. So there has to be an explanation. It can't just be that's what it is, and it's your pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, either there's a treatment uh, for that symptom, uh, 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 or we need to keep uh, uh, searching for the, the exact cause. But I find the same thing as, as you, uh, 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 that many of my patients have been told that a certain symptom is related to pulmonary fibrosis. And one of the big ones is fatigue. Uh, I feel like that uh, most of my patients that are living with pulmonary fibrosis now or some autoimmune conditions that are really track of fatigue. But in IPF specifically, I don't really believe that fatigue, uh, that that condition alone is, is, is a, a common cause of fatigue. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to know when my patients are experiencing fatigue, particularly if it's new or changed because of these, you know, other things that we want to think about like sleep apnea, 
um, and uh, and additionally, you know, the the impact of some of the medications that people are taking and so on. So I think that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, so I have a great question here. Um, I, it appears to be from a caregiver um, suggesting that you know their loved one uh, complains of some concerns kind of between visits. Um, and uh, but then when they go to the doctor's appointment, he when he says, you know, how are you doing? He says, fine. You know, very short, simple. I'm good. All is fine. I'm guilty of that too. Um, but uh, so, what what are we looking for when we're asking that question? And and what sort of health information should a caregiver be looking for um, to uh, to maybe if you know if it's okay with their loved ones to to raise concerns about during those visits? Yeah, that's a that's a great question and and. Um... Uh, I, uh, I see this all the time. And um, particularly, um, uh, although I don't, I don't wanna um, kind of single out a certain sex, but I, I, my experience is uh, men tend to uh, downplay their symptoms, maybe because they don't wanna come to doctors or have to do additional testing. Uh, but but um, I always get the truth uh, from the spouse. And so I like to invite uh, the spouse into the, the visit um, and um, or a friend or any kind of uh, uh, provider that knows the patient really well and their input means a lot to me. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I tried to, I would say that, uh, you know, as the, as the uh, provider, it may be something that you want to tease out at home, find out why they're minimizing symptoms when they get there. Is, is there a reason? Are they fearful? Because I do believe people are scared. So there's a lot of uncertainty in our field. Uh, we don't know what the progression is going to be sometimes. We, there's no trajectory, particularly in the early stages. And the less is more approach is often taken by many patients, meaning like, if I don't know, it's not going to cause a problem. And so, um, you know, teasing that out at home maybe saying, look, we're trying to prevent things. And then also having a very close relationship, I think, with your doctor, uh, where um, as, as the care provider with your, your the patient's doctor saying uh, that uh, reaching out on your own and saying well, that's not true, uh, they have more complaints than they reach. Yeah, that's, a, that's great advice. And I know we have a lot of caregivers that uh, that tune in and, and listen. So I, I hope that they're um, they're paying attention. It's a really important relationship there. I have a question here about um, about weight loss. It's something that um, that you didn't talk much about. It is, um, but it is certainly something that we see in uh, in our pulmonary fibrosis patients, and for different reasons. When you are seeing a patient who um, maybe they're not complaining, um, but they've started to lose weight and you've noticed it and maybe it's not intentional, right? Some of us are losing, you know, some of our patients are losing weight to be healthier, fitter, transplant candidates just, you know, generally get to a healthy weight. Um, there are others who maybe are getting, getting to a, a healthier weight, unfortunately, in particular, you know, maybe a wrong, wrong way and not trying. So how, what, is, what goes through your mind when you're seeing somebody that's experiencing that? Great question. So uh, weight is an important uh, kind of marker. Weight gain and uh, weight loss are important markers for physicians. So weight gain could be from overeating and um, you know, too much calories in, not enough exercise, or could be a condition such as fluid accumulation from problems with the heart. Okay, so any change in the weight in the up direction is a concern, and the same is true for any uh, decline in weight. Even if patients tell me that they're doing it intentionally, I want to understand how they're doing it, because I've always tried to lose weight and I can never do it. So, and it's really difficult to, to lose weight. So, is it true? Is your calorie count really going down, or is your exercise really going up to legitimately do that? Okay, and if so, that's fine. If not, then I need to investigate. And my number one culprit is always 
patients that are on antifibrotics or on just a host of medications, is so are the medications causing it? Which means that, you know, and, and, and is appetite down? Is it, are they having uh, diarrhea? Are they having GI symptoms? But even in patients that really don't complain of a lot of GI symptoms, I have had medication holidays and then people have gained weight. So some of these medications can affect absorption throughout calories through the GI system, or it could just lead to some anorexia, meaning like you're not that hungry. Your typical foods, you're eating less, but it's really the medications, it's not because they're following a better diet, okay? And often family members, again, or care providers tell me this about patients. So I look at medications, and then you have to look at for other things, okay? So um, you know, there are hormone issues, so even the thyroid, you can lead to actually weight loss, although it's classically associated with weight gain, you can lose, lose weight because it also can decrease appetite. And then more serious things, obviously, like cancer and things like that can be associated with weight loss. So weight gain, weight loss are very important markers, uh, just like breathlessness, um, uh, you know, shortness of, more shortness of breath or worsening cough, all these things are taken seriously, should be investigated and explained. And when you leave the clinic, you should have an understanding of kind of why you're gaining weight or, 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 uh, or losing weight. That's a fantastic answer. I think it's so important um, to understand that and not assume that it's just disease related. Um, and, you know, if it, you know, is or isn't, I think healthy, if we're trying to get to a healthy weight, to do that in a healthy way, right, um, that we're not losing muscle mass too much and, and getting weak over over such things. So um, great answer. Thank you. Um, I do have a question here about um, screening uh, patients with pulmonary fibrosis for lung cancer, which is uh, one of the common comorbidities that we that we deal with. Yeah, so fortunately, it's common. I mean, fortunately, it's uncommon, uh, but we worry about it because it's serious, right? So um, uh, I would just say that, um, you know, just to start off, because you already, you know, people with pulmonary fibrosis have a lot to worry about, and now going in cancer uh, is a term is, is scary. Uh, but, you know, I think it's best to talk to your doctor about that. We have an approach here at Thomas Jefferson where we, uh, we do the same screening as you would um, uh, for the regular high-risk population. Uh, which is smokers that have smoked a certain amount, either 20 or 30 pack, depending on the guidelines that you go by. Uh, but pulmonary for patients with pulmonary fibrosis in the ILD clinic at Thomas Jefferson, uh, we know that uh, patients with pulmonary fibrosis, even if you weren't a heavy smoker, have a higher risk of lung cancer than the regular population. And so we still do screening. Now, in the old days, we used to do PET scans all the time, to monitor disease, we don't do that anymore. So we typically do it every two years, but there's not really a lot of data to support what we're doing and we're hopeful that guidelines will still, will soon provide better recommendations. But our approach is that we do it every couple of years where we do a CAT scan to screen for lung cancer. Yeah, that actually mirrors my practice as well in general. Uh, for those people who don't have, you know, lung cancer screening indication just by other risk factors. So if that's a good um, thing for people to know and think about um, as they're seeing their physicians and uh, and thinking about their care. But this is one a great... Is, oh, go, go ahead. One, one thing to say about the screening that uh, because insurance companies do not really love the idea of screening in patients that don't have risk factors and there's not really enough uh, understanding of pulmonary fibrosis at, at the insurance companies, we often just do it to monitor disease uh, of pulmonary fibrosis and don't say it's lung cancer screening in the patients that were not smokers. Yes, that is correct. And it serves a dual purpose and that's okay. Um, this is a great question I have um, from a, a, an attendee here that is looking for a new primary care physician. Um, and uh, some suggestions for um, somebody who has pulmonary fibrosis, maybe even familial pulmonary fibrosis in this particular Asker's case, 
um, who's looking for a new primary care doctor, what, what would you recommend that person be looking for, be asking about, so on? So great question. And primary care physicians are like precious uh, gems. Okay, and I think uh, our medical, uh, and I won't get too uh, um, you know, political here about what our medical system has done, but it's created a very subspecialty uh, focused uh, um, uh, mindset. And I think that you know, the primary care physician to me is the cornerstone to, to medicine. So just like a marriage, okay, you, you know, this primary care physician you should have for the rest of your life, ideally. Um, if they're not about to retire. And um, I think it may uh, um, you know, be a benefit to you to actually interview, uh, you know, go in there and see how you feel and if you gel. It doesn't have to be a perfect marriage. You're not spending a uh, day and night with this person, but do they have good listening skills? You know, do they hear, do you, is your personalities gel? Do you feel rushed? You know, these kind of things. And then I recommend switching if you don't find it to be a connection. Uh, but you know, I think one of the things about any doctor is you don't have to be that smart, but you do have to listen. And if you listen and pay attention, it's it's usually the relationship goes really well. And and I think that uh, that that's how I would recommend selecting uh, your primary care physician is are they a good listener? Do you feel like they care about you. That's a really good answer. I think a couple of things that I might add is if you're, you know, just really don't have a lot of recommendations, you might ask your pulmonologist if they've got someone that they have worked with frequently that they might recommend. Um, and then also, you know, communication is so important, not just listening, but somebody who can communicate with your other doctors, particularly your pulmonologist, but the other, you know, the other people who are involved in in the care, um, so that because you know there are uh, multiple problems potentially to juggle here, that uh, you don't get very siloed where one person doesn't necessarily know what's going on um, from the other person's perspective. So those are all, I think, um, important factors in picking the right person. And you are right; they are. Um, really, really valuable if you've got a good primary care physician, hold on to them <laughs> um, for as long as possible. Um, I have, I uh, think we um, are almost out of time. I think I have time for probably one more question here. Um, and that is regarding um, the overlap of pulmonary fibrosis and COPD that you mentioned, that being uh, um, the most common pulmonary uh, or respiratory comorbidity. Um, can, so can you have both? I think we mentioned that. And then how does your approach differ um, if you've got overlapping emphysema or COPD in a patient with pulmonary fibrosis? Okay, this is a big deal. I know I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna to try to be quick, but this is really important question. And this is a, a exceedingly frustrating aspect of my care. Many patients are diagnosed with COPD because it's much more common and spend about three years with COPD treatments, but ultimately find they have pulmonary fibrosis. They're separate conditions that can actually occur together and they're treated very differently and their clinical course is different. Pulmonary fibrosis in particular, IPF tends to be a progressive condition and COPD tends to be an episodic condition. And so the challenge is, is understanding when is the episodic condition you know, uh, happening and not a reflection of the progressive condition often in pulmonary fibrosis. And so, Having a doctor that appreciates the separation between the two, understanding your symptoms, COPD exacerbations often associate with kind of, uh, you know, infectious symptoms and a thickened, you know, sputum production. But, you know, that, that's not always true. I mean, IPF can, can, can exacerbate like that. But I would just say, again, as I mentioned, know your symptoms, talk to your doctor, things change. Um, and then understand what your medications are for, because some people with progressive pulmonary fibrosis are given more inhalers. Well, that's not going to treat your, you know, uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So um, I think there's often mistreatment and confusion among the two conditions. And um, I would just say, do your best to try to work with your doctor to understand which symptoms relate to which of the two. That is a perfect answer and perfect timing. 
Um, we are out of time for today and we had a lot of questions we couldn't get to. Um, we will try to follow up with people if we're able by, um, by email, um, if you had a question that wasn't answered. Um, but thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Summer. This is a wonderful uh, presentation of, a, of an important, important topic. So thank you all. Give us just a moment of your time when the webinar closes for some feedback, and we will see you next month at our next webinar session. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.